Okay, so uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we give thanks that we can meet using the technology that's available to study your word, and we ask you to be our teacher and our guide in this year's study to help us understand the things which have transpired in the past, which affect us here on earth so greatly, and which caused your death on the cross, and which uh, gives us a, a deeper understanding of your love for us, that you wish us not to perish, but to have everlasting life, and that we desire to be restored to the Eden beauty that uh, you once uh, gave to our parents in the past, and that uh, we pray that this here study uh, helps us to our day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um, so just this is like a brief sequence of events uh, from after Satan was expelled from heaven. <clears throat> we covered this here last week. So as soon as uh, Satan and the angels were expelled, uh, the Father then consulted with Jesus about carrying out their purpose to create the earth and man. And then uh, that was created. Uh, man, all the living creatures and so forth in six days. Uh, after that, their Satan is amazed at his lost condition. And uh, angels are casting bitter recrimination at each other. And an angel is passing Satan and he entreats him to have an interview with Jesus. And that interview is granted. Satan then repents before Christ and seeks to be restored uh, to, pre to his previous position. Uh, Jesus wept for Satan's woe, but uh, said that he could not uh, restore Satan to heaven, that the jeopardy of heaven's peace and happiness would be a threat, and that Satan hadn't, uh, it wasn't really, it was only just through the Sort of like uh, he hadn't really fully repented in the sense it wasn't because he offended. It was just because he was in such unhappiness that he was uh, wanting this restoration. It wasn't because he had offended God. He, he, he didn't like the consequences of his sin. Yes. And I think it was quite similar with, uh, with Judas. She says something very similar. That mm -hmm. when uh, Judas came before Christ and out uh, at the trial, he threw down the money and um, pleaded with Christ. You know, I saw a grip and um, for forgiveness, Jesus said, "My, I can't remember." El might talks about it. Great deserve ages. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. but uh, he hadn't really fully repented. And the sense we have it's just the consequences. Yeah. So we have other examples of that. Aiken, Saul, you know. Yes. There's a kind of repentance, but it's just they don't like how it turned out. But put in that yes. same situation, they would still do it again. They'd be unchanged. Yes. Uh, so after that, uh, Satan's hatred increases and uh, he begins to taunt the good angels at heaven's gates and to annoy them. Uh, Satan begins to consider inciting rebellion uh, with Adam and Eve. And uh, his angels are seeking after him and he informs them of his designs. I've only just done this. Here's a few typos. I have to uh, fix this. <laughs> I just put it on. just noticed that I wrote designs right. So um he informs them that he's, he's wanting to incite them to rebellion. And he holds a consultation with the evil angels. And at that there time, some of the angels are, are not too sure about uh, what his plans are, whether they're fully backing him or not. Satan says that he's the only one to be entrusted uh, to do that work. And uh, he then goes alone to mature his plans. And he leaves the other angels just to uh, consider the matter. And then uh, when he's thinking about his plans, Satan shudders. 
at the thought of increasing his guilt. Um, and he's, he's not particularly decisive about uh, committing his way to deceiving Adam and Eve and to destroying their happiness. And then the evil angels uh, seek him and they inform them that they will unite with his plans. And then Satan casts off his feelings of weakness and becomes committed to brave the matter and to use cunning to achieve his purposes. And then God assembles the angels to take measures uh, to avert the evil. And two angels go to visit Adam and Eve and warn them of Satan's designs. And it doesn't seem to be that uh, they had any knowledge of Lucifer prior to this year time or to Satan and that rebellion which occurred. And so they're informed of all that which would take place. Uh, they're informed not to separate from each other. And they are also informed about what will happen if they eat of the tree and disobey God and that uh, Satan can only tempt them at the tree. And uh, Adam and Eve then assure the angels that they will obey God and then they break into praise and Satan hears us hear praise and it really uh, riles him up and uh, makes him determined to incite them uh, to defy God. And then we yeah. read about the temptation. Okay, just another thought going back um, to... So when God rejects Satan's uh, repentance... Um, if Satan had truly been repentant, he would have accepted the consequences instead of seeking to rebel against God. Right. Right. So so God, you know, you know, somebody could say, well, if God had just forgiven him and said, yes, you're forgiven, then maybe Satan wouldn't have continued his rebellion. But God knows the heart. So the whole issue of the great controversy is that God can actually judge the heart. And so. When Satan repents and God rejects that repentance, we can see that God was correct in doing that because of how Satan acts afterwards. Right. You know, a yes. true repentance it doesn't like if I repent of some, something and I ask somebody's forgiveness and they don't forgive me, I don't go, well, you know, you didn't forgive me. So, you know, uh, I'm going to get you right. If I'm truly repentant, I will still be repentant, even if that person doesn't accept my forgiveness. Right? I will have changed my behavior. And, mm -hmm. and so Satan hasn't. So, But the whole issue of the great controversy is in the end, Satan will acknowledge the judgment against him as just, as will all the wicked. And that's why we have... So if, if Satan had um, accepted... If, if he had truly repented... I mean, God would have accepted him, right? But but he didn't, right? So it's not like God is just saying, "Well, you know, you know, I, I I don't have mercy for you." God was merciful, but he knew that Satan was unchanged because he had sinned with such great light. There was really no turning back for him. Yes, as the seeds of rebellion were still within within him. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he was hopelessly ruined. And then, yeah. so we read that uh, Satan possessed a serpent, and then to seize Eve, and then Eve confronts Adam after she had ate the fruit. So we're going to read, we read all of that, right? As far as I know, I think so, yeah, I think we, uh, Remember where we stopped? I think it was here. Yeah. Uh, as far as I know, I sort of briefly had a wee quick look there where we finished off. And, okay. Yeah, I think uh, we can just read the, the commentary on the right uh, from there. So Eve had thought herself capable of deciding between right and wrong. The flattering hope of entering into a higher state of knowledge had led her to think that the servant was her special friend, 
possessing a great interest in her welfare. As she sought her husband, and they had related to their maker the words of the servant, they would have been delivered at once from his artful temptation. God instructed our first parents in regard to the tree of knowledge, and they were fully informed relative to the fall of Satan and the danger of listening to his suggestions. He did not deprive them of the power of eating the forbidden fruit. He left them as free moral agents to believe his word, obey his commandments and live, or believe the temper, tempter, uh, disobey and perish. And then the, the ill effects uh, begin. So after tr- Adam's transgression, he at first imagined that he felt the rising to a new and higher experience. But soon the thought of his transgression terrified him. The air that had been mild and even temperatures seemed to chill them. The great wisdom they obtained was the knowledge of sin and a sense of guilt. They felt the dread of the future, a sense of want and nakedness of soul. The sweet love and peace and happy, contented bliss seemed removed from them and in its place was a want of something came over them that they never experienced before. They then, for the first uh, turned, they then, for the first turned, is that right? For the, they then, for the first turned their attention to the external. I don't know if that sounds right. Maybe. They, would, they would just say, we would say now, they then, for the first time, turn their attention to the external. Yeah, but, I think maybe is, is time messing out there? I don't know. <laughs> no, it's, that just the, it's just it's just the um, the dialect that she's writing in, mm-hmm. right? Okay. They they just leave out the word time. They then, for the first, turn their attention to the external. Just means for the first time. Yes. So they had not been clothed, but were draped in in light. As were heavenly, as were the heavenly angels. This light had, which had instructed them, departed to relieve the sense of lack and nakedness, which they realized their attention was directed to seek a, comf- a covering for their forms. For how could they meet the eye of God and angels unclothed? Naked and ashamed, they tried to supply the place of the heavenly garments by sewing together fig leaves for a covering. Their crime is now before them in its true light. Their transgression of God's express command assumes a clearer character. Adam censures Eve's folly in leaving his side and being deceived by the serpent. They both flattered themselves that God, who had given them everything to make them happy, might yet excuse their disobedience because of his great love to them and that their punishment would not be so dreadful. After all, Satan exulted in his, ex- in his success. He had now tempted the woman to distrust God, to question his wisdom, and to seek to penetrate his all-wise plans. And through her, he had also caused the overthrow of Adam, who, in consequence of his love for Eve, disobeyed the commandment of God and fell with her. So, uh, further commentary. The Lord would not have them to investigate the fruit of the tree of knowledge, for then they would be exposed to Satan masked. He knew that they would be perfectly safe if they touched not the fruit. Our first parents chose to believe the words as they thought of a servant, yet he had given them no tokens of his love. He had done nothing for their happiness and benefit, while God had given them everything that was good for food and pleasant to the sight. Everywhere the eye might rest was abundant and beauty, was abundance and beauty. Yet Eve was deceived by the serpent to think that there was something withheld which would make them wise, even as God. Instead of believing and confiding in God, she basely distrusted his goodness and cherished the words of Satan. Um, uh, maybe. Theodore, would you like me to read read a wee bit for me, please? Okay. Uh, The angel's response. 
The news of man's fall spread through through heaven. Every harp was hushed. The angels cast their crowns from their heads in sorrow. All heaven was in agitation. The angels were grieved at the base ingratitude of man in return for the rich bounties God had provided. A council was held to decide what must be done with the guilty pair. The angels feared that they would put forth the hand and eat of the tree of life and thus perpetuate a life of sin. The Lord's visitation and curse and the curses. The Lord visited Adam and Eve and made known to them the consequence of their disobedience. As they hear God's majestic approach, they seek to hide themselves from his inspection, whom they delighted while in their innocence and holiness to meet. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? This question was asked by the Lord, not because he needed information, but for the conviction of the guilty pair. How didst thou become ashamed and fearful? Adam acknowledged his transgression, not because he was penitent for his great disobedience, but to cast reflection upon God. The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. The woman was then addressed, what is it? What is this that thou hast done? Eve answered, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. After Adam and Eve had eaten of the forbidden fruit, they were filled with a sense of shame and terror. At first, their only thought was how to excuse their sin and escape the dreaded sentence of death. When the Lord inquired concerning their sin, Adam replied, laying the guilt partly upon God and partly upon his companion. The woman put the blame upon the serpent. Serpent, why did you make the serpent? Why did you suffer him to come into Eden? These were the questions implied in her excuse for her sin, thus charging God with the responsibility of their fall. The Lord then addressed the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. As the serpent had been exalted above the beasts of the field, He should be degraded beneath them all and be detested by man inasmuch as he was the medium through which Satan acted. He was told of the sorrow and pain that must must henceforth be her portion. The Lord said, thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. In the creation, God had made her the equal of Adam. Had they remained obedient to God in harmony with his great law of love, They would ever have been in harmony with each other. But sin had brought discord and now their union could be maintained, could, and now their union could be maintained and harmony preserved only by submission on the part of the one to the other. And unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shall thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. God cursed the ground because of their sin in eating of the tree of knowledge and declared, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. He had apportioned them the good, but withheld the evil. God now declares that they shall eat of it. That is, they should be acquainted with evil all the days of their life. The race from that time forward was to be afflicted by Satan's temptations. A life of perpetual toil and anxiety was appointed unto Adam instead of the happy, cheerful labor he had hitherto enjoyed. They should be subject to disappointment, grief, and pain, and finally come to dissolution. They were made of the dust of the earth, and unto dust should they return. Thank you. Expelled from Eden. They were informed that they sh- that they would have to lose their Eden home. They had yielded to Satan's deception and believed the word of Satan, that God would lie. 
By their transgression, they had opened a way for Satan to gain access to them more readily. And it was not safe for them to remain in the Garden of Eden, lest in their state of sin, they gain access to the tree of life and perpetuate a life of sin. They treat it, sorry, they entreat it to be permitted to remain, although they acknowledged that they had forfeited all right to blissful Eden. They promised that they would in the future yield to God implicit obedience. They were informed that in their fall from innocence, from innocence to guilt, they gained no strength but great weakness. They had not preserved their integrity while they were in a state of holy, happy innocence, and they would have far less strength to remain true and loyal in a state of conscious guilt. They were filled with keenest anguish and remorse. They now realised that the penalty of sin was death. Angels were commissioned to immediately guard the way to the, of the tree of life. It was Satan's study plan that Adam and Eve should disobey God, receive his frown, and then partake of the tree of life, that they might perpetuate a life of sin. But holy angels were sent to debar their way to the tree of life. Around these angels flashed beams of light on every side, which had the appearance of glittering swords. In humility and in expressible sadness, Adam and Eve had left the lovely garden wherein they had been so happy until they disobeyed the command of God. The atmosphere changed. It was no longer unvaryingly, unvaryingly as before the transgression. God clothed them with coats of skins to protect them from the sense of chilliness and then of heat to which they were exposed. So that was that was fear was more colder and hotter at times rather than just like a constant uh, temperature. And then another section about the plan of salvation. Does uh, someone else want to read, read for me the, uh, the following uh, paragraphs? Let me read. Thanks. Jesus confounds with the Father. Sorrow filled heaven as it was realized that man was lost and, and, and the world that God created was to be filled with mortals doomed to misery, sickness and death, and there was no way to escape for the offender. The whole family of Adam must die. I saw the lovely Jesus and beheld an expression of sympathy and sorrow upon his countenance. Soon I saw him approach the exceeding bright light, which enshrined the Father, said my accompanying angel. He is in the close converse with, the, with his Father. The anxiety of the angel seemed to be intense with, seemed to be intense while Jesus was communing with, the, with his Father. Before, before the Father, he pleaded in the sinner's behalf. Long continued was that mysterious communing for the fallen sons of men. The plan of salvation had been laid before the creation of the earth, for Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Yet it was a struggle, even with the king of the universe, chilled up his son to die for the guilty race. Should I continue? Uh, yeah, the next paragraph as well, please. Three times he was shone in by the glorious light about, about the Father, and the third time he came from the Father, his person could be seen. His countenance was calm, free from all perplexity and trouble, and shone, and shone with benevolence and loveliness, such as words cannot express. Yeah, thank you, Samuel. And then, uh, maybe Theodore, could you read the next oh, section? Okay, let's go back, go back to uh, a little bit. I just want to comment on something. 
Okay, so um, so Ellen White says, you know, the plan of salvation had been laid before the creation of the earth, right? So we know that he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Yet there's this struggle here at this time. So this this kind of is parallel to what happens in the Garden of Gethsemane. Right? I mean, each step of the plan of salvation, there there still is a struggle. Now here yes. it's it's the father struggling to yield up his son to die for the guilty race. We're in the Garden of Eden, or the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Gethsemane. So this is the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Gethsemane, it's the son struggling, right? Mm -hmm. Because he's now a man. So so it's very interesting, um, this idea. Yeah, and then it says it three times. Yeah. He was shot in the glorious light about the father. I'm just wondering... Uh, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, how many times did he say, not my will, but thy will be done? Is that three times? I, I think so, but I could be wrong. But yeah, I would have to find that. Yeah, because there's a few times he goes away from the disciples and pray, he yeah. prays huh. and then he goes back to them and they're sleeping yeah. and he yeah. says to pray and then he goes back again. It's like... Yeah, there's three times. Where he says, not my will, but thy be done. Um, three times was the prayer offered, but followed by, nevertheless, not my will, but thy be done. This is from uh, In Heavenly Places, page 147. I'm sure it's in other places. Yeah. Yeah, so you have like a parallel. Okay. So what's going on there? And then maybe you could read the next paragraph. Jesus relates his course to the angels. He then had made known to the angelic host that a way of escape had been made for lost man. He told them that he had been pleading with his father and had offered to give his life a ransom and take the sentence of death upon himself, that through him man might find pardon, that through the merits of his blood and obedience to the law of God, They could have the favor of God and be brought into the beautiful garden and eat of the fruit of the tree of life. At first, the angels could not rejoice, for their commander concealed nothing from them, but opened before them the plan of salvation. Jesus told them that he would stand between the wrath of his father and guilty man, that he would bear iniquity and scorn, and but few would receive him as the son of God. Nearly all would hate and reject him. He would leave all his glory in heaven, appear upon earth as a man, humble himself as a man, become acquainted by his own experience with the various temptations with which man would be beset, that he might know how to succor those who should be tempted, and that finally, after his mission as a teacher should be accomplished, he would be delivered into the hands of men and endure almost every cruelty and suffering that Satan and his angels could inspire wicked men to inflict, that he should die the cruelest of deaths, hung up between the heavens and the earth as a guilty sinner, that he should suffer dreadful hours of agony, which even angels could not look upon, but would veil their faces from the sight. Not merely agony of body would he suffer, but mental agony, that which, with which bodily suffering could in no wise be compared. The weight of the sins of the whole world would be upon him. He told them he would die and rise again the third day and should ascend to his father to intercede for wayward, guilty man. Thanks. So the angels are told their role in the plan. The angels prostrated themselves before him. They offered their lives. Jesus said to them, that he should by his death save many, that the life of an angel could not pay the debt. His life alone could be accepted of his father as a ransom for man. Jesus also told them that they should have a a part to act, to be with him and at times strengthen him, that he should take man's fallen nature and his strength would be even equal with theirs. 
and they should be witnesses of his humiliation and great sufferings. And as they should witness his sufferings and the hate of men towards him, they would be stirred with the deepest emotions and through their love for him would wish to rescue and deliver him from his murderers, but that they must not interfere to prevent anything they should behold, and that they should act a part in his resurrection, and the plan of salvation was devised, uh, and his father had accepted the plan. <clears throat> With the holy sadness, Jesus comforted and cheered the angels, and informed them that hereafter, those whom he should redeem would be with him and never dwell with him, and that by his death he should ransom many and destroy him who had the power of death. And his father would give him the kingdom and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven, and he should possess it forever and ever. Satan and sinners should be destroyed, never more to disturb heaven or the purified new earth. Jesus bade the heavenly host to be reconciled to the plan that his father accepted and rejoiced that fallen man could be exalted again through his death to obtain favour with God and enjoy heaven. Then joy, inexpressible joy, filled heaven. And the heavenly host sung a song of praise and adoration. They touched their harps and sung a note higher than they had ever done before for the great mercy and condensation of God in yielding up his dearly beloved to die for a race of rebels. Praise and adoration were poured forth for the denial and sacrifice of Jesus, that he would consent to leave the bosom of his father and choose a life of suffering and anguish and die an ignominious, what's that word? ignominious death to give his life for others. Uh, someone uh, want to volunteer to read the next paragraph? Treat, said the angel, think ye that the father yielded up his dearly beloved son without a struggle? No, no. It was even a struggle with God, with the God of heaven, whether to let guilty man perish or to give his beloved son to die for them. Angels were so interested for man's salvation that there could be found among them those who could yield their glory and give their life for perishing man. But, said my accompanying angel, that could avail nothing. The transgression was so great that an angel's life could not pay the debt. Nothing but the death and intercessions of his son could pay the debt and save the lost man from hopeless sorrow and misery. But the work of the angels was assigned to them to ascend and descend with strengthening balm from glory to choose the Son of God in his sufferings and administer unto him. Also, their work would be to guard and keep the subjects of grace from the evil angels and the darkness const constantly thrown around them by Satan. I saw that it was impossible for God to alter or change his law to save lost, perishing man. In God's arrangement, it was never to lose its force, not, nor give up the smallest part of its claims. Therefore, he suffered his, son, his beloved son to die for man's transgression. Okay, thank you. So that's like a summary of the previous paragraphs. Uh, Satan's reaction and descriptive features. Satan again rejoiced with his angels that he could, by causing man's fall, pull down the Son of God from his exalted position. He told his angels that when Jesus should take fallen man's nature, he could overpower him and hinder the accomplishment of the plan of salvation. I was then shown Satan as he was a happy, exalted angel. Then I was shown him as he is now. He still bears a kingly form. His features are still noble, for he is an angel fallen. But the expression of his countenance is full of anxiety, care, unhappiness, malice, hate, mischief, 
deceit and every evil. That brow, which was once so noble, I particularly noticed. His forehead commenced from his eyes to recede backwards. I saw that he had demeaned himself so long that every good quality was debased, and every evil trait was developed. His eyes were cunning and sly, and showed great penetration. His frame was large, but the flesh hung loosely about his hands and face. As I beheld him, his chin was resting upon his left hand. He appeared to be in deep thought. A smile was on his countenance, which made me tremble. It was so full of evil and satanic slyness. His smile is one he wears just before he makes sure of his victim. As he, and as he fastens the victim in his snare, this smile grows horrible. Angels visit Adam and Eve. The angels of God were commissioned to visit the fallen pair and inform them that they, that although they could no longer retain possession in their holy estate, their Eden home, because of their transgression of the law of God, their case was not altogether hopeless. They were then informed that the Son of God, who had conversed with them in Eden, had been moved with pity as he viewed their hopeless condition and had volunteered to take upon himself the punishment due to them and die for them that man might live, that man might yet live. Though, sorry, through faith in the atonement of Christ proposed to make for him, uh, through Christ the door of hope was opened that man, notwithstanding his great sin, should not be under the absolute control of Satan. Faith in the merits of the Son of God would so elevate man that he could resist the devices of Satan. Probation would be granted him, in which, through a life of repentance and faith in the atonement of the Son of God, he might be redeemed from his transgression of the Father's law, and thus be elevated to a position where his efforts to keep the law could be accepted. The angels related to them the grief that was felt in heaven, as it was announced that they had transgressed the law of God, which had made it expedient for Christ to make the great sacrifice of his own precious life. So Adam's response. When Adam and Eve realized how exalted and sacred was the law of God, the transgression of which made it so costly a sacrifice necessary to save them and their posterity from utter ruin, they pled to die themselves or to let them and their posterity endure the penalty of their transgression rather than the son rather than the beloved son of god should make this great sacrifice the anguish of adam was increased he saw that his sins were so of so great magnitude as to involve fearful consequences and must it be that heaven's honored commander who had walked with him and talked with him while in his holy innocence, whom angels honoured and worshipped, must be brought down from his exalted position to die because of his transgression. Um, Theodore, could you read the next few paragraphs? Yeah. Adam is further instructed. Adam was informed that an angel's life could not pay the debt. The law of Jehovah, the foundation of his government in heaven and upon earth, was as sacred as God himself. And for this reason, the life of an angel could not be accepted of God as a sacrifice for its transgression. His law was of more importance in his sight than the holy angels around his throne. The father could not abolish nor change one precept of his law to meet man in his fallen condition. The son of God, who had in unison with the father created man, could make an atonement for man acceptable to God by giving his life a sacrifice and bearing the wrath of his father. Angels informed Adam that as his transgression had brought death and wretchedness, life and immortality would be brought to light through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Let me keep reading. Yes, please. Okay, Adam is given insights of events to come. To Adam were revealed future important events from his expulsion from Eden to the flood and onward to the first advent of Christ upon the earth. 
His love for Adam and his posterity would lead the Son of God to condescend to take human nature, and thus elevate, through his own humiliation, all who would believe on him. Such a sacrifice was of sufficient value to save the whole world, but only a few would avail of themselves of the salvation brought to them through such a wonderful sacrifice. The many would not comply with the conditions required of them that they might be partakers of his great salvation. They would prefer sin and transgression of the law of God rather than repentance and obedience, relying on by faith upon the merits of the sacrifice offered. This sacrifice was of such infinite value as to make a man who should avail himself of it more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Adam was carried down through successive generations and saw the increase of crime, of guilt, and defilement, because man would yield to his naturally strong inclinations to transgress the holy law of God. He was shown the curse of God resting more and more heavily upon the human race, upon the cattle, and upon the earth because of man's continued transgression. He was shown that iniquity and violence would steadily increase. Yet amid all the tide of human misery and woe, there would ever be a few who would preserve the knowledge of God and would remain unsullied amid the prevailing moral degeneracy. Adam was made to comprehend what sin is, the transgression of the law. He was shown that moral, mental, and physical degeneracy would result to the race from transgression until the world would be filled with human misery of every type. Okay, thanks. Uh, a commentary on mankind's degeneration. The days of man were shortened by his own course of sin and transgressing the righteous law of God. The race was finally so greatly depreciated that they appeared inferior and almost valueless. They were generally incompetent to appreciate the mystery of Calvary, the grand elevated facts of the atonement and the plan of salvation because of the indulgence of the carnal mind. Yet notwithstanding the weakness and the enfeebled mental, moral and physical powers of the human race, Christ, true to the purpose for which he left heaven, continued his interest in the feeble, depreciated, degenerate specimens of humanity and invites them to hide their weakness and great deficiencies in him. If they will come unto him, he will supply their needs. It's quite um, humbling. You know, there's nothing there really you know, to be, for us to be, to be, to be uh, sort of labelled so weak and depreciated and degenerate. You know, it is, uh, for those who are pride, it's kind of a would, would be seen as an offence. So Adam makes his first sacrificial offering. When, uh, when Adam, according to God's special directions, made an offering for sin, it was to him a most painful ceremony. His hand must be raised to take life, which God alone could give, and make an offering for sin. It was the first time he had witnessed death. As he looked upon the bleeding victim writhing in the agonies of death, he was to look forward by faith to the Son of God, whom the victim prefigured, who was to die man's sac who was to die man's sacrifice. This ceremony offering this cer ceremonial offering, ordained of God, was to be a perpetual reminder to Adam of his guilt and also a penitential acknowledgement of his sin. This act of taking life gave Adam a deeper, a more perfect sense of his transgression, which nothing less than the death of God's dear son could expiate or atone. He marveled at the infinite goodness and matchless love which, could, which would give such a ransom to save the guilty. As Adam was slaying the victim, it seemed to him that he was shedding the blood of the Son of God by his own hand. He knew that if he had remained steadfast to God, 
and true to his holy law, there would have been no death of beast nor of man. Yet in the sacrificial offering, pointing to the great and perfect offering of God's dear Son, there appeared a star of hope to illuminate the dark and terrible future and relieve it of its utter hopelessness and ruin. God was jealous for the honour of his law, and the transgression of that law caused a fearful separation between God and man. After his transgression, God would communicate to man through Christ and angels. Um, maybe you could read the next paragraph, Theodore, again. Come near the end. Yeah. Okay. Commentary on our quest for answers concerning the evil we see in this world. The entrance of sin into heaven cannot be explained. If it were explainable, it would show that there was some reason for sin. But as there was not the least excuse for it, its origin will ever remain shrouded in mystery. To many minds, the origin of sin and the reason for its existence are a source of great perplexity. They see the work of evil with its terrible results of woe and desolation. And they question, how can all this, how can... They question how all this can exist under the sovereignty of one who is infinite in wisdom, in power, and in love. Here is a mystery of which they find no explanation. And in their uncertainty and doubt, they are blinded to truths plainly revealed in God's word and essential to salvation. There are those who, in their inquiries concerning the existence of sin, endeavor to search into that which God has never revealed. Hence, they find no solution of their difficulties. And such as are actuated by a disposition to doubt and cavile, seize upon this as an excuse for rejecting the words of Holy Writ. Others, however, fail of a satisfactory understanding of the great problem of evil from the fact that tradition and misinterpretation have obscured the teaching of the Bible concerning the character of God, the nature of his government, and the principles of his dealing with sin. It is impossible to explain the origin of sin so as to give a reason for its existence. Yet enough may be understood concerning both the origin and final disposition of sin to make fully manifest the justice and benevolence of God in all his dealings with evil. Nothing is more plainly taught um, more plainly taught in scripture that then that God was in no wise responsible for the entrance of sin, that there was no arbitrary withdrawal of divine grace, no deficiency in the divine government that gave occasion for the uprising of rebellion. Sin is an intr- intruder for whose presence no reason can be given. It is mysterious, unaccountable. To excuse it is to defend it. Could excuse be for it be found or cause be shown for its existence, it would cease to be sin. Our only definition of sin is that given in the word of God. It is the transgression of the law. It is the outworking of a principle at war with the great law of love, which is the foundation of the divine government. Yeah, it seems to be like a messing word there. Yeah, the word um, in, in, yeah, it, uh, taught in scripture. So yeah, there should be the word. Yeah. I'll just check her. out. So it might have been a minor copy that right. Maybe. Okay. So so one thing here about about this. So we know that that God temporarily takes upon Himself the responsibility for sin, even though He's not ultimately responsible. Right. That is, God did create us and created us with the possibility of sinning. Right. That is, he gave man free will. So in in a certain sense, God is responsible, but not in the ultimate sense. Because because of the plan of salvation and the remedy he has for sin. But, you know, in some ways, you could almost say that sin was inevitable. But, you know, that's that's kind of more speculation than anything because we know before the foundation of the world god had already provided uh, a remedy for sin so he obviously knew of its origin and, um but he's still not responsible ultimately 
because there's no reason for sin to exist. It's it's completely unreasonable. Yes. Uh, so just some commentating on that there, that God was in no wise responsible for the entrance yeah. of sin. There's a quote there, sort of, to me, related to this. Yeah. Uh, Ellen White says that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. While the shade comes by the sun, it is not created by it. It is some obstruction that causes the shadow. So darkness emanates not from God, but is the result of an intruding object between the soul and God. So just the, the final conclusion. From the first, the great controversy had been upon the law of God. Satan had sought to prove that God was unjust, that his law was faulty, and that the good of the universe required it to be changed. In attacking the law, he aimed to overthrow the authority of its author. In the controversy, it was shown whether the divine statutes were defective and subjective to change, or perfect and and immutable. When Satan was thrust out of heaven, he determined to make the earth his kingdom. When he tempted and overcame Adam and Eve, he thought that he had gained possession of this world because, he said, said he, they have chosen me as their ruler. He claimed that it was impossible that forgiveness should be granted to the sinner and therefore the fallen race were his rightful subjects and the world was his. But God gave his own dear son, one equal with himself, to bear the penalty of transgression and thus he provided a way by which they might be restored to his favour and brought back to their Eden home. Christ undertook to redeem man and to rescue the world from the grasp of Satan. The great controversy begun in heaven was to be decided in the very world and the very same field that Satan claimed as his. So you're done there now? Yep, once we finished. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just uh, close the prayer. Uh, dear loving Heavenly Father, we thanks for this here uh, plan of salvation that in our hopeless condition, uh, you provided hope for us through the death of your son, Jesus Christ. And um, has saved us from uh, great wretchedness. We have a, the potential now to uh, dwell with you forever. And that uh, we here all bow before you, ask that we can be delivered from sin and that uh, the blood of Jesus Christ uh, can cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Help us to obey, be obedient to your law in, in every particular. And um, we pray that we can help others find the hope, the remedy that you have provided uh, to redeem them uh, from the curse of sin and uh, to be delivered into the glorious kingdom of your dear son. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.